Hi, and welcome to the What is God podcast. I'm Shifra Bloom, your hostess. And on this podcast, I ask people from all walks of life to answer the question, what and where is God and what does it have to do with me? And so today we have a very special guest and his name is Scott Seymour. He's a dear friend of mine. And Scott is an incredibly multidimensional person. He is a nurse and also a mindset, conscious partnership, breathwork, and life coach, a facilitator for sacred plant ceremonies, and a producer of films in Austin, Texas. And I had even forgotten that you were a nurse, Scott, um, when you were reminding me of all of these things. And I was just remembering how multifaceted you really are and how much depth there really is to you and the space that you hold and the work that you do. And so I'm really excited to get to have this conversation with you on this topic. Thank you for having me, sister. It's an honor to be here. It's always fun to talk to you. We always go so deep and it's always so interesting. And so today I want to hear your perspective on this question that clearly fascinates me because I keep asking it. So the question is, what and where is God and what does it have to do with me? And I will give you the floor, Scott. I love this. I love this question. I love this uh, podcast. I love the direction of it. And I think it's so relatable for everyone because it's everyone's interpretation of this. Mm -hmm. And what is God? I believe God is love. Mm. And that's a very simple, basic answer. But I also believe that love is the fabric that weaves all things together. Uh, God is literally not just a separate entity, but God is oxygen. God Mm. is the life force that we breathe in biblical terms, when people say that God is around us, God is within us, it is not just a metaphor. It literally is God is the all-encompassing, life-sustaining energy that fuels all living and non-living things. I also truly believe that God is within the sun and all suns. And I also believe that the sun is a portal. So the the way that we receive all energy, all nutrients, any element from the periodic table comes from source, comes from divine source, comes from creator. And as creation, we are a part of the creator. And that entity of love, which we are, is the fabric in which we're all woven from. Hmm. Thank you. I really love how clear of an answer that was and how pithy and and well spoken and so i wrote some notes down (laughs) of course because that's what i do (laughs) (laughs) you know in the in the in the coaching work that i do i don't know if you know this about the coaching work that i do or not in the coaching work that i do one of the things that is unique is that i will usually transcribe what my clients are saying as they're saying it did you right. know that about my work? I did not know that you do that with your work, but that makes sense. I, yeah, I didn't remember. And so and so that's part of why I like to take notes and I listen so carefully mm-hmm. to the actual words that people are speaking. Um, and so like in the coaching work, like I'll transcribe and really focus in on the actual words because the words that we speak are spells, right? They're They're affecting us all the time. So anyway, I took notes as I do. And um, yeah, you're not thinking anything. I say the word apple, all of a sudden you see an apple in your mind. I'm actually casting that inside of your mind. It's the highest form of communication. Absolutely. And now I'm thinking of an apple instead of whatever else, whether, whether what you've just said as apple is now a distraction or whether it's something that's supportive to me, you know, it could be either, but that has just affected my experience. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway, now we're already on a tangent, but the the best example I can think of is like, if you, if you say, well, there's many examples, but it's like, don't think of an elephant. Now you're thinking of an elephant, right? Or especially if you're a kid, if you're a kid, don't cross the street. The image you get is of you crossing the street. So that's the power of words, Scott. And I have a lot we could talk about, but, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, so, so the power of words, even in, uh, in describing of all things, God, it's also powerful. And so 
there were really five points that I wrote down. One is the first one was love. Mm -hmm. And a question came up, but I'm going to go through all five before we go off on more tangents. But a question came up when you said love. And I I wondered, I, I said to myself, huh, I wonder when or where or, you know, under what circumstances, if Scott remembers that he came to that definition that God is love. That was one question that came up for me. If, you know, I don't know if there's a pinnacle moment where you had a realization of God as love, but that question came up. The second thing you wrote is, you know, oxygen and the air that we breathe and the that that was like the third is like a life force and the air that we breathe. These are all kind of tied together. The, the fourth one was all encompassing and life-sustaining energy that fuels all living things. And that really is very close to my, you know, if I were to give a one-liner definition of God, it's the infinite life force that animates all of creation in each moment anew. And so it's a very similar phrase. And then you also said um, God as the sun or in the sun. And, you know, that's something that I was curious about too. And then you started talking about the elements and the minerals. And so um, I guess you took us from meta to more specific, uh, which is really interesting to connect to God in all of those different ways. So there's a lot that you could elaborate on. And I I guess if there's one particular way you want to take it, any of those pathways would be super interesting to me. Absolutely. So when I first, it's so strange because as a child, I grew up in the church. I grew up in the Catholic church and I definitely had a falling out with the church. And I understood God to be this entity that had judgment and cast right and wrong. I had a falling out with the church. I came back to the church after college because this girl that I liked. And so it it was really like this coming back to, and, and then I started even teaching with the junior high kids. And it wasn't until there was a kid who asked a question that I was babysitting him and his brother. And he's like, so if Jesus saved this planet, does that mean like Jesus has siblings on other planets? Like that just like saved (laughs) other planets or is there another Jesus or like, what's the, is that just our name for it? And I was like, great question. Let me ask the church staff. And they were like, that's blasphemy. And I'm like, I don't like this. Um, And when I started doing more of the spiritual work that I now do with holding plant ceremonies, when my wife and I went down to Peru and sat for two ayahuasca ceremonies in 2019, it really became evident to me that God is ultimate love and unconditional love and true unconditional love is unconditional. And if there's a condition on that love, then it's manipulation because we all can love each other, but that love only matters to us. And it's how we treat the people that we say that we love that determines that relationship. So true divine motherly love, mother Mary love, like divine creator love will accept you exactly the way that you are. And being the creation in the middle of this earth school in these skin and dirt suits, it's It's loving ourselves exactly where we are. So knowing that things in life happen for us and not to us, and we're being presented with the exact set of characters, situations, and circumstances to be met for our highest next step of evolution, if we're willing to look at the next things as such, then it's seeing all things with this love because we can change our perspective as to how we look at something. We can see something as a gift. We can see something as a curse. And it's that perspective. And a miracle can be as simple as a shift in perception. So it's having that shift in perception of not being a victim, but seeing ourselves as intentionally being put here to face everything that we have in front of us, to face the next step of our evolution with that love. And so embracing the things that are before us, not cursing them and saying, wow, this is all a gift. Even if it's really hard, especially if it's really hard those are the biggest gifts. And so meeting everything with that love and appreciation and saying, even if it's the most jaded hard pill to swallow, this is, this is the beauty. This is the gift. And if it is hard to swallow and I am triggered, then that's my work to do because that is where I have my own unresolved trauma within me. And I think that's where I got the most activated doing any of this shadow work to begin with was saying, wow, if I'm activated, if I'm triggered with something, 
that means that I'm unresolved with it. That means that unresolved is within me. And that's where I have that work to do. And it's up to me to clear that sanskara, to clear that scar on my heart, to take out that thorn in the side of my soul's skin so that the next person that brushes up against it doesn't brush up against that thorn in my skin, but brushes up against a healed scar. And mm-hmm. I get to embrace and love everything versus cringe or try to create a bubble around something and avoid things because I truly believe in life. We're only relationship with ourself and everyone else is just a mirror. Mm. So it's, if I'm not willing to accept someone else, that's me not being willing to accept myself and that reflection of myself in someone else. I hope that people will listen to that again, (laughs) (laughs) because you just explained so articulately uh, the the journey of evolution of a of a human being, and that that bit right there was definitely worth listening to a second time. Um, because we chose this, right? We right. chose like this was an active choice. Our like the bravest of souls choose to come into earth at this point in time and to face these things and the things that we choose not to face, we will either hand off and continue to pass down to other people or our lineage, or we're going to have to face the next time we go around this. And so it's, it's really of what are we willing to face? What are we willing to heal from to increase our own awareness and have that evolution of our soul? Cause only like the bravest souls do this. And I had this thought the other day too, which was kind of cool, which was, very much so Yeshua spoke into this when he was here that we misunder we misunderstand what heaven is and that heaven is a place inside of our soul. Mm. And what if heaven was only as beautiful as the what if heaven was heaven's beauty was dictated by how big and how fully we live here on earth? Like as opposed to it just being this beautiful, it's actually it's actually created by us being these dendrils of creation and us stepping into our magnitude in the same way that we can only love others as much as we've healed and loved ourselves. Mm -hmm. That heaven is only as beautiful as the creation that we create with the elements while we're here on our earth school, you know, any, any other planet, any other reincarnation, but whatever we do will actually dictate how beautiful heaven actually is. It's not just, we just get to go there and be forgiven it's we're already forgiven, we're already in love, but it's up to us to stand in our magnitude, not out of egoic state, but out of the fact that we are God in human form. And in our fullest expression of why we're here, we actually carve out the beauty of heaven. Hmm. <laughs> Your face that's is fun. so expressive right now. That's that's a really <laughs> beautiful concept. Is that did you, did you say you heard that from a specific place or is that something you that were was exploring? That was me. That was a download while running. Wow, that's so beautiful. Or upload. If it was already within me, then it was just a deep remembering and anamnesis. And no, just like. Wow. That's. I've, I've definitely, I'm definitely familiar with like the idea of, you know, whether or not heaven's this actual place that you, you know, go to that heaven is also this place inside of ourselves that we can reach, you know, now. And even the the concept of, I've, I've heard the idea, a similar idea around the concept of Messiah also. Um, but you also said something about that things happen for us and not to us. And right. then, yeah. And then you also said, um, you said something it's cool listening to your words because some of the things you're saying are similar to things that I sometimes say. And then some of the things are like, wow, you said that so differently. That's so interesting to think about. Like even the way you just described heaven, it's like not a foreign idea, but you've just described it in a different way. That is really cool to think about. Um, Yeah. But then the, the idea of, so the way that the evolution of the soul idea, the way that I say it, and tell me if this is um, kind of what you were saying is, is that life gives us experiences. And this is more how I see it from like the Kabbalistic perspective is life gives us experience. And each experience is 
you know, is life, is our higher soul, is God's way of offering us an opportunity to grow and expand in our soul's evolutionary journey. And so a challenge is really like if, if life was a video game, like a challenge would be like, here's this opportunity to grow and to up level to the next level of the game. And then you expand and you evolve. Exactly. It's kind of, have you ever heard of the drama triangle? Actually, it's not ringing a bell. It's a, uh, it's a tool that I use in coaching, but it's like, you're stuck in the drama triangle if you're not oh, aware the of it. Drama so, triangle. Okay. Yeah. So there's the three roles of the villain, the victim, and the hero. Right. And it's like yeah, when right. you cast someone as the villain or you're playing the victim or someone else is the hero, they're stuck in that role. And the only way out of the drama triangle is through awareness. And when you create awareness, you take 100% responsibility for the situation. So the victim with full responsibility is no longer a victim. They become the creator of their relationship. The challenger, or sorry, the hero for that matter, as opposed to taking over the reins and doing it for someone, they end up being the coach and they show them how to do it. And then the villain, as opposed to being like you were saying, someone who we ridicule or is getting in the way, they're the challenger. And they actually challenge us into seeing the greater of ourselves. So it goes from it's the drama triangle to the empowerment dynamic is what it's called, but they're two different triangles that flip on each other. What was the second? There's a victim, the villain, and the victim, the villain, and the hero. Oh, and the oh, and the hero, and, and so, the hero becomes the coach. Right. The victim becomes the creator, and the villain becomes the challenger. Hmm. So I feel like these all this side of the conversation falls into that category of. What does it have to do with me? What does God have to do with me? Right. You know, it's like these are the different faces of of our own expression of God that we can inhabit while in this journey mm -hmm. of evolution. Yeah. And I think that would turn into what does that have to do with me would be perspective. Like I was on a brother's podcast the other day and they were asking me where does someone have the most work to do where can someone find the most work that they have to do on themselves and I'm like where they don't love themselves mm. where they don't fully have that love for themselves so this is a perspective shift into realizing that we're not just here having this experience yes we are having this experience but then when we take that full responsibility of being God in human form and take the responsibility of showing up in that magnitude and realize that we're only limited to that which we limit ourselves to. Right. Then we become the creator and we're no longer the victim of the circumstance. Then it doesn't happen to us. It happens for us. Well, and it's interesting because looping it back around, if if love, you know, love was the first definition of God that you gave, right? And so if the question is, where can we find where we have the most work to do? And the answer to that is where we don't love ourselves, then could we also say another way of saying that is like where we're not in touch with God, meaning God as love. It's like the yeah. places the places where we're n n creating a lack of intimacy with that which we call God. In this and when we have shame God. or guilt for ourselves, then we're actually shaming and guilting part of God in our experience and not accepting that portion of us doing the best that we could with that level of awareness where we were. I like to picture it like we're all sitting at the round table, like Knights of the Round Table, like King Arthur, yeah. and us now are sitting at the head of the table and there's a version of us at every single age from one all the way up to 41 for me. And if there's a version that I don't love or I hold in shame or guilt for any reason, they're not talking to me. Right. They're not giving me information and I need all their information. They have a dunce cap on and they're sitting in the corner. And until I love and accept them, they're not going to feel comfortable sharing. And I need them. So I'm curious because so I'm on my website right now, if people go and if they want to sign up for my newsletter, there's um, an ebook that I have. It's right now it's called the 11 ways to heal through Kabbalah, but previously it was called the 11 ways to heal guilt and shame through Kabbalah. Mm. And that's specifically what it is. So I'm, you know, and so I have, people are welcome to go at shefrabloom.com. They can go download the freebie, but I'm also curious um, from your perspective, 
how, like if someone just wanted like an introductory, wow, you know, maybe this is landing for them and they recognize that there's guilt and shame that they're still holding on to and that that thereby is limiting their ability to fully love themselves, which is therefore limiting their ability to fully have intimacy with that, which we call God and evolve mm -hmm. into their full potential. Like where, what would, what would be a place that you might recommend for people from your perspective to just, to just, you know, maybe they're starting on that journey or maybe, maybe they've been doing it for decades. Like I have, and they still realize that, you know, there's layers. I would say that Shifra is an amazing resource and you should definitely look into hers. Uh, but from your you... from God's perspective, because you're here on this podcast, because I also respect your right. perspective. And, and I'll, I'll give my references at the end of this for myself, where you can reach me. Um, yeah. As well, I would say that to do some of the work on the basic level on yourself, I would say to pick up the book, uh, The Untethered Soul by oh, Michael I've read Singer. That. Yes. It's a phenomenal book. And it's a great way to start that relationship with self. I would also say the work of Byron Katie. Excellent. Um, her website is thework.com. And she does three free webinars, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of every week where she actually works through and does free workings with people. I didn't know she did that. Oh yeah. And then That's you can get cool. downloads of the judge your neighbor worksheet on her website also. And it's just, it's simple questions. It's simple questions of the things that have activated you and you can start to work on those and unravel that for yourself as well. Wow. That's cool. I didn't know she did that. That's so cool. Did you, did I tell you yet? I, I, I keep forgetting what I've told you already or not that I'm going to publish my book finally this summer. Hell yeah, you are. <laughs> so, so people can look out for that. I can't wait to show it to you and to everyone. Um, and if this resonates with anyone, uh, again, yeah, you can look me up on Instagram. It's Journey of Man. My name is Scott Seymour, and there's a whole thing. Of, I have a one-to-one -one coaching, and I have a program called UBU, the University of Being Yourself, and it's all about getting back in touch with who you are yeah. on the intrinsic level and remember who you are from the inside out versus trying to be who the world wants you to be from the outside in. I, I think it's important to share resources. I, I just, you know, I remember when I was 23 years old, I had just come back from Israel where I went really deep into the mysticism and I was now living in Boulder, Colorado, and I was um, teaching yoga and I was in herbal medicine school. And I remember, and this is like pre-Instagram, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it's just a different culture, you know, a different culture in the in some in a lot of ways back, back way back then. <laughs> and um I remember desperately yearning and praying to God for the right mentor. Mm. Like specifically deeply aching for a mentor and it was it was it was hard to find and eventually like by now I've been blessed to have had many wonderful mentors but at the time I didn't and so I just you know I love sharing these kinds of resources with people because everyone's going to um, resonate with you know different different people in a different path. And so I think partly it's like compassion for my own 23 year old self that I don't want other people to be in that position because we live in a society where it's not necessarily um, taken for granted that you're going to have, you know, a, a lineage of wisdom keepers in your immediate circle that are just with you from birth, you know, and the grandmother sitting around the fire. It's not the world that we necessarily live in. Yeah. We're definitely in the information age and we're drowning in information and we're starving for wisdom. Hmm. Like the distilled knowledge for someone, because everyone, I don't say everyone, it's a projection. There are a lot of people who just spew out a lot of things because they heard it and they conceptually understand it, but they don't know it. Right. They haven't lived it. And so they don't intrinsically have the embodied feeling of it. And it really is, especially for me, like the work started heavily for me because I've had an aunt and an uncle who both committed suicide and I've attempted three times before and my father's attempted three times and 
there's something about getting to that place where you don't remember how to love yourself and you don't know how to remember that love that you are. And it's so easy to be in the pain and then realize that that here's this ejection seat to the human experience. And that seems a lot better because my ex doesn't like me and my family doesn't accept me. And I'm just in this pool of shit. And why do I want to put this on anyone else when when there is such divine orchestration to where we are and like we're going through what we're going through for such an important reason. And so for anyone to remember that beauty and remember that in the midst of it and then have that lifeline, have that lighthouse when someone's capsizing at sea and knowing where those resources are is so important. So thank you for being that light for so many. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it just it just makes me think of how, you know, this life school, as you called it, and like, it's so beautiful. And it's so challenging at times, too. Right. And then, <laughs> you know, like, I, and I was gonna ask you, like, when you when you go through those moments of darkness, or pain, um, because I know you've, you've been through depth in your life. Mm. And like, but like, what is that experience of then coming out the other side of that? How does that, like, I, I want to hear from you. Like, what is your experience of when you come back out from the underworld and, and you see the light again? What is that experience? How is it different? It's It's so hard in those times to truly believe that my soul has a dharma. Like, I, I really believe that people can get on board that some people have gifts and that some people can just learn to play the piano without having to know and like uh, take lessons. It's that we, but to know that there is a soul vocation, to know that there is a, a truth to the underbelly of our soul and a reason why we're here, that we've been so near to death so many times and like just cutting an inch deeper or just not having a support system there and just just even knowing or feeling and saying wow i i feel like i'm my feelings i feel like i'm my pain but the i think the treading and keeping the head above water came from realizing with the with the the right mentors and the mm -hmm. right guiding points to remember that i am not my thoughts Mm. that I am not my feelings, mm. that I am the consciousness that gets to experience my thoughts and my feelings, and that all the emotions that I have have a 90-second lifespan if I don't recycle them on top of each other, similar to I am not the waves that come and crash on my shore. I am the shore. I am the constant. And mm. if I like, and it's all going to be okay in the end. And yeah. if it's not okay, it's not the end. Mm. So it really is like, Feel the feelings, feel the emotions, let them crash. The bigger ones will last a little bit longer. The softer ones will be there. They'll, they'll all sculpt the sand just a little bit, but the sand is okay. Mm. Like the, the eternal love, which is what we are, is what I am, accepts everything. Similar to one of the exercises that my wife, uh, Emily, loves to do and that I love so much is if we just look around the room that we're in, and we take in the walls around us. Do the walls have an opinion about how we feel? They just accept us for how we are. There's a sense of structure and security in that. And that's the essence of the love that we're from, is that it accepts and it loves us exactly the way that we are. And when we can take the reassurance that whatever we're feeling internally is okay, and it's there for a reason. All feelings deserve to be felt. There's nothing wrong about the feelings that are being felt. It's just getting to the root of understanding them. Like That's the why it's not just, I'm like sorry. The past is through, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's just, that image came up so strong as you were speaking. I just had to say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and that's why in, in love with God being the topic of the conversation, it's like, even with, it's so difficult 
especially when we're young and growing up because we're indoctrinated <clears throat> into certain religions, but that to un even unravel that, right? To realize that religion is the rules and regulations imposed by man in the approach to the conformity and the worshiping of God, hmm. where spirituality is like God's calling in our soul or religion is believing in someone else's story and spirituality is believing in our own. And it's just getting in tune with that divine creator within us and then embracing that love and, and grounding back into that, which accepts us just as we are as babies, like the most pure form that comes into this world is just love before any other stories come on top. So it's like getting back in tune with that and then meeting where we are with that level of acceptance. You know, there's, there's this narrative, especially I find it in the coaching world, but just in our culture right now, that's very strong of, you know, cause you're talking about Dharma and purpose. And I, I believe that, that one of the foundational principles of how this world works is essentially paradoxical, like a lot mm. of, uh, one of the truths that I hold is everything that's true is a paradox and a paradox, meaning that it's opposite is simultaneously and equally true. So like I am an individual and we are one is the best example I can think of for that. But one of those is also that I have a very unique purpose and that like, it's not that I don't, but, but that sometimes I feel that the way our culture repeats the narrative is misleading. And mm. what I mean by that is that I think, I, I do think, and I'm in the coaching world, right? And I help yeah. people tap deeply into their sense of purpose and, and you know, to kind of peel back the uh, mask a little bit from what's going on behind the scenes is that, you know, there's this hyper focus on that I have to be special and I have to like be this big flashy Shifra bloom and this is my purpose. And what if, what if really my purpose and perhaps, I mean, I could, can really only speak for myself, but what if more of our purpose was to be able to give and receive love to our full capacity through the unique vessel that is me with all of mm -hmm. my gifts and talents and skills and personality. But what if my gifts and talents and skills and personality were more the mechanism than the goal? And the mm -hmm. goal was actually to give and receive love through the mechanism rather than like the other way around, for example, which is, is a narrative that I hear out there is that my purpose is my talent with words and my purpose is my beauty and my purpose is um, that I'm a coach. And if I do it really good, then I'll be deserving of love. Right. It's it's the opposite. Right. I think it's even a merging of the two because one is very egoic and saying, this is what I'm here to do. And if we really step into being the channel through which the divine gets to orchestrate through and really step into each moment and be like, how can love work through me? How can love serve through me? How can I love with the energy of God in each person that I interact with in each moment and then still step into those gifts yeah. and like not be afraid to, to, to utilize them, but not to be boisterous about it, not to be self personifying, but the intention. Also, exactly. The intention is to merge the two. So in essence, let my will and thy will be one mm. is to say, let me, let me serve for thy will. And let me also be here to serve at the greatest capacity with what has been bestowed upon my heart. And the more that I make it about not me and make it about others, then hopefully the two will kind of like a Venn diagram go from like two separate circles into like merging more into one and really being how I get to show up is that surrender experiment into surrendering to what the universe presents to me and realizing that when the universe presents something to me, that's me presenting it to myself. And it's up to me to not just say from my perspective, this is what I want. But when that's being brought to me, that's also me showing me that that's what my 
my opportunity is as well. So it's like, how much can I incorporate the two and then surrender my personal desires by letting them be God's desires too? So <clears throat> I'm curious, maybe as we wrap up, there's so many other things that we, we could talk about, but I'm just curious if there's a story that comes to mind, whether it be from your own life experience or whether it be from you know, someone you've witnessed or worked with perhaps of like, what is, what it can practically look like when someone does surrender and does, you know, tap into letting love work through them. Um, I'm just curious if anything comes to mind to speak on when I share that. Well, I don't know if it's my mind controlling a thought, but like, right as you were saying that I was thinking of a conversation I had recently with a sister of mine, who's very religiously biblical and and she was saying how god is a man and i was like do you know that for a fact because the church is made by men and it's like the father the son and it's like it's all this hierarchy and mankind is there womankind because women are included in mankind and the father how do you know it's just a mother and a father i think binary is really what god is um <laughs> that's a rabbit hole that's another hole uh, specifically to, or to go and take it a different way though. If so, you know, like take it, take it, <laughs> you know, you, you mentioned earlier something about mother Mary too, actually. Mm -hmm. And, and some, it was something I was like, I don't know if we'll have time for that. But now that we're talking about, you know, my question made you think of this male, female aspect mm -hmm. of God, maybe that is something to touch on, um, because you've talked about Mother Mary in a couple of our conversations, and um, I'm more familiar with Jewish mysticism than with Christian mysticism. So I, I'm i curious how, if, if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit more on like your relationship to Mother Mary and how, she, how her essence and teachings play a role in um, connecting to the divine. Well, in the studies that I've had um, surrounding Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene and how both of the Marys were uh, female practitioners of the Temple of Isis uh, in Egypt and how, you know, immaculate conception and light working Ka energy bodies were able to be conceived without insemination from a man but it's actually within the female womb that energy was able to be harnessed and have babies without fathers but by the orchestration of the feminine in this focused light work that they're able to do that uh that the power of the feminine is the the way of nature like there's man's way and there's women's way which is like the way of nature like waves come and go leaves in the sky they they blow both directions clouds across the sky they go it's it's with the flow of nature and i really truly believe that mankind saw how powerful women were and then tried to harness and suppress and that's why there's not a lot of feminine power that's spoken about within biblical texts but that that she was the womb of creation that she was the that she was the foundation point for for Yeshua and then even with Mary Magdalene with her high like sex priestesses and teachings that she had was with her and Yeshua's divine union was the activation point for his elevation of consciousness and how he was able to ascend the way that he did so it's only through true consciousness and spiritual awakening which is done through creation practices which are sexual practices that 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 is activated and it's through the portal of the feminine um and that these women who really understood and took the time to to take those practices and do it with love and reverence were the ones who created some of the most powerful figures of uh, of religious text um wow <laughs> that's all really fascinating 
And, and just to, I mean, I guess to answer what you were saying, cause I was just really at the same time saying that I was like two wheels were spinning in my mind. Yeah. And I, of all the different spiritual experiences and, you know, if I put a tally number on it, I've probably had over 80 to a hundred different mushroom ceremonies and different ceremonies of ayahuasca in different places and times. And I think one of the most powerful experiences that I ever had was during a, a five MEO DMT ceremony down in, um, in Peru, uh, about two and a half months ago. And when I, when I was in the ceremony, the last question that you asked was about that relationship in those times or those big working moments with God. And that's where, that's where I got I was, I was allowed to see the love affair between creator and creation and seeing from the birth of the planet, like billions of years ago to present day, to the extinguishing of our solar system, to seeing the, all the love, seeing all the pain, seeing the, the hatred towards God, seeing the love towards God, seeing the, the pain, like the pleasure between the lovers, seeing the reign of different generals who were doing things in the name of God and creating massacres to the greatest love affairs of all time. And, and seeing it all and seeing the absolute beauty of it all and seeing how significant and insignificant it all is yeah. in the great scheme of all the planets and all the solar systems and the thousands upon millions of other stars that exist and how important it is for us to do everything that we can do and be everything that we can be and equally how insignificant and significant it all is. And that's also where I was able to see when I opened my eyes after the ceremony that God is in the oxygen, like that breathing is an act of prayer. Yeah. That our presence with each other is an act of prayer. Like me being present with you right now is seeing God through you and taking in all of God's beauty and not looking somewhere else, not being distracted by something else, but by taking you in, it's actually appreciating the, the life source that I am that's being brought forth through you. So when you're speaking to me, that's me speaking to myself through you. And when I'm speaking, it's you speaking to yourself through me. And it's like yeah. this, it's how much can that, that presence really bring forth, I mean, that awareness of each other and, and be able to learn from and through each other. And that's where the breath is so important. And that's why even water is the cup of life because it's two molecules of oxygen with one hydrogen combining them, it's like two elements of God in one. And that's why so much life is available in the ocean. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. You just brought it, brought it down, which is cool. Like all the way from these esoteric practices. And then you just brought it all the way down into, you know, person to person, and then all the way down even deeper into our very selves, which is cool to see like that macro micro coming in of god yeah um, and i love the saying that i'm pretty sure that a fish was not the first entity to discover water right because it was within it's like it's hard to see a picture when you're in the frame it's because right. it's like a fish was living within it so until you're outside of the water it's hard to see the environment that we're even living within so mm. it's just even appreciating the thing that creates and sustains our life um, I want to share a really fun, like everything you're saying about the, how we're mirrors of each other. And mm -hmm. I, I want to share a really fun thing that I like to do. And I sometimes do this with my clients also, but it it can be so playful and fun. And so I don't know if you're familiar with uh, like the Gestalt dream interpretation where you are every character in the dream. Cool. I love it. It's so great. So if, you know, for anyone listening to, like, if you think of, a dream that you had recently, not all dreams can be interpreted this way, but depending on the kind of dream it was, a lot of dreams, you can literally replace the other characters as versions of yourself and get a lot of insight into the dream. And so then I take that a step further 
And I will sometimes for fun, especially if I have a weird day or I just want to tap into the magic, or maybe it was a challenging day to interpret my day, or maybe just a part of a day, a meeting, a podcast interview, you know, whatever, as if it were a dream. And I was going to interpret it like every character in the dream was myself. So that would look like Literally, like after this, I could call my sister and I could say, oh, yeah, I was I did a podcast with my friend Scott and we talked about God and he was telling me about the you know triangle of victim, hero, villain, creator, coach, challenger. Or I could tell it. Today, I sat down and gave presence to myself and went deep with myself in a conversation about God. And we talked about the depths, you know, I, I, I sat down with myself and gave myself time to think about the depths of pain that life can be. And I also gave myself time to think about purpose. And I, you know, and anyway, you can do this with any kind of exper experience. And I highly recommend that everyone try it because it, it blows my mind every time <laughs> these little bits of insight, like I could have a conversation with my neighbor and then I do it. And something profound, I usually realize from doing it. I love that. So when you just take away the 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 outside perspective of I had this with someone else, but I had this with myself. Yeah. And it, even if that. like if like someone gets upset with me, and then you know saying like, oh, maybe if somebody was upset with me and they yelled at me, and then saying you know, translating that then to, oh, earlier I was upset with myself and I yelled at myself. And like, usually there's a sting there because usually, mm. usually there's- I love that. Yeah. So I highly recommend it, especially for next time, like a challenging interaction happens to take the other person's name out and put our own name in and then just be really honest. Like, hmm, is there some truth to that? Like so-and-so lied to me. And then translating that, I lied to myself. Mm -hmm. Maybe I lied to myself about how I felt about them. In fact, you know, like what, anyway, it can be, it can go really deep. It's a fun, it's a fun and really deep practice to do. It's a powerful turnaround for, for ownership. Yeah. So, and then the other thing I wanted to share about breath and God, because you facilitate breath work, right? Correct. Right. And so I love talking to breath work facilitators about breath and God specifically, because I, it's, I think of how it, it how it says like God breathed life into man, into hu the human being. And right. specifically it says through his nostrils, but either way, like God breathes life and breathes in each moment life into us. And really the name for God in Hebrew, there's many names, but the main name that we talk that we use that really expresses how god interacts with us it's not really a pronounceable word if anything it would sound like taking a deep breath mm -hmm. and i always say like when you take a deep breath you're saying god's name and when we breathe in it's as if the you know you talked about god as a lover it's as if the lover's lips are to our lips breathing life into us and when we breathe back out, you know, it's, it is, it's a prayer to God. We're saying God's name as close as we could possibly pronounce it, at least in the Hebrew and, and, you know, kissing God back, you know, breathing back into the mouth of God. And for as long as we live, it's this beautiful um, relationship with, you know, the lover of God, that is God. And you think about on a biological stance, it's like, where do we have illness in our body? Anywhere there's a lack of oxygen, anywhere we have hypoxia. Yeah. And if you haven't, if you have a scrape, if you have a burn, you have to debrief the wound, but then it has to meet oxygen for it to start its healing. True. Well, thanks for sharing your wisdom with me today and with everyone, Scott. You're the best. <laughs> You're the best. I love talking to you. Um, I would love for you to share how people can find out more about you and the work that you're doing. You can stalk me. My home address is, <laughs> um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, I, I enjoy that platform. There's intake forms through a link tree on, on my site there. And that's at journey 
underscore of underscore man. My name is Scott Seymour, S-E-Y-M-O-U-R. And if you're interested in plant-based uh, psychedelic therapies, myself and my wife both facilitate those. And then there's a link that's in there as well for a journey within. And we facilitate those for masterminds and for individuals and for families. And um, as well, there's another uh, link or another profile called the Wolf Heart Way it is a men's group that I run out of Joshua Tree with a few brothers. And we hold men's retreats where we help men to open up their hearts and understand their feelings and and really embody that full aspect of the masculine and the feminine uh, unapologetically and kind of rewiring ourselves and figuring out how to treat the divine feminine within ourselves and in society in a much more loving and respectful way. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Um. Oh, and then I have a podcast too called Evolving Gladiators, which Shifro has also been on. And uh, you can check that out on Apple Podcasts or uh, Spotify as well. Evolving Gladiators. Evolving Gladiators, correct. And journey underscore of underscore man. That is correct. Well, cool. thanks, Scott. Absolutely, sister. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for listening. And if you enjoyed this conversation and if you're tired of people using God to shame and disconnect people and instead want to contribute to connection and to love, then please go ahead and like or subscribe to this podcast so that you can hear more of our episodes that'll be coming soon. And if you are interested in working with me personally, I do offer personal coaching to help people rapidly unlock incredible insights into their own potential. Uh, you can book a discovery call with me at shefrabloom.com. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, I will be launching my book, my card deck and my workbook, Discovering Your Inner Magic Through Kabbalah this summer. And so these together act as a way to identify what lessons your soul is trying to learn through your current life situation and what you can do to practically move forward right now. So you can find out more at chiefforbloom.com. This is the What is God podcast, and we will see you next time. <laughs>